Thank you all for joining us at this uh, dinner CME program, uh, supported by a generous grant from J&J. Uh, &J. Uh, my name is Andrew Alexis. I'm uh, out of St. Luke's Roosevelt, Mount Sinai, St. Luke's and Roosevelt Hospitals in New York City. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure and it's an honor to uh, moderate this program. We've got two outstanding speakers, also from New York, Adam Friedman from uh, Albert Einstein Medical College and Whitney Bowe, uh, who's uh, also affiliated with Mount Sinai. So we got a, a home team for me here uh, uh, at this program. Now this is a very exciting subject matter that's really, we've seen a lot of growth in this area of, of understanding the importance of the epidermal barrier. And while, his, while for many, many years uh, using emollients and protecting the barrier has just been part of our overall management of atopic dermatitis and other eczematous conditions, it's only really been over the past 10 to 15 years that we've seen uh, scientific evidence that supports the use of these and helps us better understand the mechanisms by which uh, protecting the barrier actually plays a role in minimizing flares of atopic dermatitis and other eczematous conditions. It also, over the, also over the past few years, we've seen a change in uh, the paradigm of how atopic dermatitis uh, comes about. Historically, tradi the traditional view has been that immunological events, inflammation, is the primary uh, uh, factor, which then leads to disruption of the barrier. But the current, more evolving uh, view or paradigm of atopic dermatitis is that epidermal barrier dysfunction may be a primary event, which actually induces and drives the uh, inflammatory response. And we're going to be hearing a lot about the science of this from our first speaker, uh, Dr. Friedman. We've also seen uh, growth in the area of uh, product development, development of new products that are specifically designed to uh, uh, protect the barrier and reduce epidermal dysfunction. And these, more and more, we're seeing clinical studies that show that these can actually uh, lower uh, disease severity over time, minimize uh, the frequency of flares, and so much so that, in my view, uh, management of atopic dermatitis purely from an inflammatory point of view or purely with the use of topical corticosteroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors, in other words, just focusing on using anti-inflammatories while ignoring the, uh, the barrier dysfunction uh, will result in suboptimal results and is really insufficient management of atopic dermatitis. So with, with that background, I want to uh, begin with some pretest questions. We've got three pretest questions, which we're going to ask again at the end of the program. And uh, I'd like you all to take a short break from your dinner and reach over across your tables and grab your own individual iPad. And with these iPads, you, you, you're going to be able to see the same questions on the screen and uh, enter uh, your best answers. So I'll give you a minute to get your iPads out. Okay, so the first question uh, is, functions of the stratum corneum include A, thermoregulation, B, gas exchange, C, adequate hydration, D, protection against pathogens, or E, all of the above. Go ahead and just press on the, the response that you feel is correct. So it's almost unanimous, uh, all, all of the above. We're going to get back to these questions at the end. Question two. Cornea sites protect against desiccation and environmental change by regulating water flux and retention. True or false? People still thinking about it, I guess? <laughs> there we go. 92% say it's true. A small minority say it's false. OK, we'll get back to that at the end. And the third and final question. Active steps to maintain a fully functional stratum corneum include discontinuing practices that cause damage to lipids and proteins of the stratum corneum, including over, -clean over cleansing, B, the use of sharp, of, uh, 
rather harsh cleansers or those with abrasives, exfoliants, or additives that cause irritation. C, use of astringents. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. And the survey says 92% feel that it's all of the above. Okay, once again, we will get back to these questions and see if the responses change after we hear our great speakers. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Adam Friedman from Albert Einstein Medical College in the Bronx. Uh, he's going to cover the science. Uh, the title of his talk is The Stratum Corneum from Bench to Bottle. Adam? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and tuning in. Um, I think those questions were a nice primer to the purpose of this talk. And that purpose, simply put, is taking what we understand about skin physiology, taking that knowledge and really understanding where and how cosmetics, specifically moisturizers and soaps, are derived and developed. So I have some uh, comments of interest. Pretty much these don't really apply, as I will not be talking about any specific products. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a warning. This is a basic science talk. It is going to be digestible, but it is basic science, so not for the faint of heart. Uh, but tr truthfully, as dermatologists, we do strive to learn more to understand how diseases work, how medications work, so we have a little nerd in all of us. So think about the epidermis. Uh, this should be bread and butter for the most part. You know, the epidermis is comprised of several cell types, keratinocytes being the bulk of it, melanocytes, and of course, our antigen-presenting cells, the long-run cells. What is the purpose of the epidermis? Well, there are multiple purposes here. There's barrier function, really, you know, the stratum corneum takes the charge here, but numerous functions from UV absorbing, antimicrobial, antioxidant, xenobiotic, you name it. Now, looking at this list, you think, well, the stratum corneum, that's the barrier, the meat of the epidermis, that's doing the rest of that. So the question always is, is the stratum corneum simply a, a wall, a brick wall that's keeping everything out and all the good stuff in? And my answer to that is absolutely not. This table specifically discusses the role of the stratum corneum. It is not just saran wrap. It actually has biological function and activity, maybe even more so uh, than some of the areas of the epidermis. So let's get into that. So here's the stratum corneum. This is a this is a pretty standard uh, histologic picture. Stratum corneum, this nice basket weave appearance. Once again, looks just simply like compact dead cells, anucleated cells on top of each other. Well, what's going on here? Well, from going to the bottom to the top, that's about 14 days in transit. Then it's another 14 days for that to shed. Of importance, and I'm gonna kinda highlight some themes here. There's certain things that are gonna keep coming up, and I want you to think about them both with the sector of the science, but also the product. Water in the stratum corneum is needed to shed those cells, to knock that off and allow new stratum corneum to come in. So keep that in mind. Now, in order to know who you are, you gotta know where you came from, and that applies to the stratum corneum. So we're gonna talk a little about epidermal stratification, going from top to bottom. So your basal cell layer, this is your translate amplification layer. Half the cells, they're gonna migrate up. The other half, they're gonna stick around and keep making that pudding. They're gonna keep making more cells. As the cells go up, they start to elongate, become somewhat polygonal, and this is the spinous layer. I think of this as almost like the hamburger, the meat of the epidermis. This is where we start seeing some major changes with respect to adhesion. This is where you see your adhesion proteins. This is where you see your actin cytoskeleton, keratin cytoskeleton. This is what keeps everything together. As you go up even further, more changes occur. This is where you start to see your granular layer, so aptly named because you can see those little tiny keratohyaline granules on histology. Those are your proteins, that's your pronaceous material. Moving even further up, the, the corneocytes, actually they become corneocytes as they move up from keratinocytes, losing their nuclei and forming that barrier, and then ultimately in 14 days they are shed. Now this is not just some great exodus from the basal cell layer. There are a lot of environmental changes here. First off, there's an, a change in a city. As you move up, the pH changes dramatically. And this is not a random event. This is needed. I'm gonna get into this in a little bit. You have change in calcium concentrations. And I know we have some residents in the audience, so I'm going to ask some board style questions. Hopefully there's at least one that can answer. And the person who gets the most questions right will get a tube of Aveeno, I know a guy. All right. 
So, in terms of calcium concentrations, what disorders do you see a dysfunction in pumping of intracellular calcium? Two in particular. What's the other one? Darius, good. You win. All right. Also, you have a change in the hydrophobicity. The spinous layer, this is an aqueous layer. As you move to the top, it's more lipophilic, more lipid rich. And then also as you move up, the amount of water, one would assume, decreases. So the stratum corneum has about 15% of the water in the epidermis, whereas of course about the 70% is in the spinous layer. But you still need some water there. Now I mentioned pH, this is of the utmost importance. Many of you may have heard of the acid mantle. Well, this is what they're really talking about. In the stratum corneum, you have various enzymes that will create the fats, the cement that solidify the stratum corneum. They require a certain pH. In order to make ceramides, I feel like you have to be living under a rock to not hear about ceramides nowadays. Those enzymes require a certain pH. And then the proteases that will cleave the stratum corneum, allowing new corneocytes to enter, they require a certain pH. So there's this delicate balance. And then you can think about either disease states where this pH is messed up, maybe proton pumps aren't working well, or you're doing something exogenously that changes the pH will cause some problems. So just to kind of highlight this once again, the acidic pH is needed for appropriate epidermal permeability barrier. It's important for the desquamation process. And what I didn't mention before in terms of, you know, we think about the barrier protecting us from pathogens. That pH is needed to generate some such things like nitric oxide from sweat in nitrites and nitrates to kill pathogens to maintain the skin microbiome. So you mess with the pH, you mess with the environment. Now, I'm sure we've all heard the old adage, pediatric patients are not just little adults. Well, pediatric skin is not just tiny little skin. There are distinct differences, and especially in neonates, they can dehydrate very easily. They have less natural moisturizing factors, which we will talk about. They have increased transepidermal water loss. The stratum corneum is thinner, if that's even possible, because already it's on the order of 15 microns. Um, and even the, the keratinocytes are a little different. So we gotta think about neonatal skin, pediatric skin, a little different from, differently from adult skin. So I hope you are starting to get the picture that the stratum corneum is not just a brick wall, that has numerous activities, that is a biological entity, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. In keeping with that construct of brick and mortar, well, the brick is made up of those anucleated, uh, anucleated corneocytes, but these aren't just bricks. They're, I kind of think of them like that, that gum gusher, where you bite into this hard gum and this juice kind of squeezes out because they've got some juice in there. There are natural moisturizing factors, there are keratinocyte, keratin filaments that allow for adhesion of the stratum corneum. So it's not just a brick. Now the corneocyte is surrounded by the cornified envelope, we'll talk about that in, in a moment, um, but once again, that core is very important. And those lipids, the mortar, is not just surrounding, but it's actually incorporated into this protecting barrier. This is just electron microscopy, to kind of see how it all falls together. You have your corneocyte here, this is your cornified envelope, lipid, another corneocyte, Here's a corneodesmosome connecting them. So it's a very close, tight-knit family. So as I mentioned, these are not just bricks. There's stuff in there. But in terms of just function of the corneocytes, that hydration is key. Even though it's not a lot, you still need a little. It has to do with how you perceive touch. It also has to do with the rigidity or the flexibility of the skin. I mean, think about fissures, these almost like perfect little V breaks. That probably has something to do with the rigidity of the stratum corneum, that while your skin moves, it doesn't flow. Rather, it's very rigid. It can break like a plank. Now, around the corneocyte is a cornified envelope, and this provides extra protection and is made actually on the inside side of the corneocyte. Now, from a board perspective, lorcrine is the number one component in the cornified envelope, even though we talk about other elements a little bit more, other proteinaceous elements. These are your cross-linking proteins. These are things that will lock everything in together. And there are so many of them. They are first made in the spinous layer. That is your keratin hyaline granule. Those granules are these proteins. And there are a ton of them. We probably have all heard of filaggrin. You can't not hear about it with respect to the atopic dermatitis story. Uh, but no question, lorcrine, probably the most important in terms of serving as the bulk of that cornified envelope. So this is kind of how it all comes together. This is very complicated. You have so many different proteins. Filaggrin more is affecting over here. You also have to think about, okay, you have this cross-linking. Well, what's doing that cross-linking? So it's not just about having those elements. You need the proteins, the enzymes, to actually let this happen. So you can imagine, forget even the lipids down here, we'll get to that later. 
you can imagine that there's a problem with just one of these things, you know, you can actually have a lot of issues and, and pathology. And at the end of the day, if you have issues in any of these, whether inherent mutations or these are antigens, these are targets for antibodies, things just fall apart. That's the answer. And so when you're thinking about these genodermatoses, which any resident in the room is dreading thinking about for the boards, because there's so many, so many genes, don't memorize. Think about it, what does that gene do? What does it make? What is the function? And that will allow you to kind of envision the clinical phenotype. So it's not just about straight matching and memorization. It's about knowing how these things work. But if you think about all these things, whether it be transcontaminase, which cross-links flagrin, or you have a flagrin defect, the end result is the same. You have barrier dysfunction. You have dry dysfunctional skin. Now, I, do, I don't want to completely write a flagrin and say, oh, lorcrin's better, because flagrin does more than cross-link. When the skin, when the stratum corneum, corneum is dehydrated, this activates capthacins, and this degrades the filaggrin to produce natural moisturizing factors, specifically PCA. In addition to that, the breakdown of filaggrin produces an inherent photoprotectant, uracanic acid, which actually has some degree of SPF uh, activity, and there have been a lot of papers about this. So filaggrin in its form is a crosslinker, but when you break it down, you get so much more. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. This also makes you think about atopic dermatitis, where you have a mutation flagrin, so it's not just about not cross-linking, but it's also you're losing those natural moisturizing factors. All right, let's get to the sea of fat, which is the, the transcellular, intracellular lipids. That was me, just kidding. Um, that wasn't funny. So, roll cell stratum corneum lipids. Same idea here, you're creating a, a barrier, and it's solidifying those corneocytes. It is creating a permeability, a permeability barrier. Now, interestingly enough, you would think that a fatty layer would have no water, but that's actually not true. You have these little aqueous channels. And this is how hydrophilic, water-loving, or water-soluble ingredients can actually get through the stratum corneum. They don't keep everything out. That's how water gets through. There are these little channels you can get through, but they are quite small. Now, the take-home message here are what are those stratum corneum lipids? And these are ceramides, cholesterol, and free, free fatty acids. They play very nicely together. They actually have to in order to have good function. So this kind of solidifies, no pun intended, the kind of pronation materials and the lipids. So you have a cornified envelope, you have a lipid part of the envelope, the extracellular matrix, which contains proteins and, and, and lipids, and then once again, you have that extra layer. And here are your granular cells, carotohyaline granules, and your lamellar bodies. And here you can actually see how this is happening. So you, in, your, in your granular layer, the lamellar bodies, the way I always remember this L for lipid versus keratohyaline granules, which have your proteins, they're dumping this into this extracellular space. So in your lamellar granules, you have your precursor lipids, and you have your enzymes that will make those lipids. To kind of go back to what we first talked about, this is a pH-dependent process. If your pH is altered, those enzymes don't work, and you don't make your fatty acids, you don't make your ceramides. Function is obvious, keep water in, bad stuff out, um, but also those enzymes, those proteins in the lamellar, gram and lamellar bodies, they're needed to cleave the stratum corneum. I mentioned this before. So once again, pH very, very, very important.